Sangye Chudang Soki Chognam La Jang Chu Bardu Dagni Kap Suchi Dagi Chun Yin Gi Pesonam Gi Dro La Ping Chu Sangye Dru Par Sho Sangye Chudang Soki Chognam La Jang Chu Bardu Dagni Kap Suchi Dagi Chun Yin Gi Pesonam Gi Dro La Ping Chu Sangye Dru Par Sho Sangye Chudang Soki Chognam La Jang Chu Bardu Dagni Kap Suchi Dagi Chun Yin Gi Pe Sonam Ki Dro La Pen Chu Sangye Dru Par Sho So let's, <coughs> let's spend a few minutes meditating on the breath. So just find the point where your breath goes out and comes in through your nostrils. You can just you can just feel it there. Coming in, going out. So just put all your attention, all your concentration, your focus right at that point. Keep it there for as long as you can. Just breathe normally. And then the moment you find that your mind has gone off your breath to some, somewhere else, just bring it straight back Continue focusing on your breath. Let's just do that for a short while. Keep your mind on your breath.
and now just look into your mind, check your motivation for being here this morning. Ask, ask yourself, you know, why, why have you come to the centre this morning? If you find the reason uh, has to do with just seeking some kind of benefit for this life alone, you know, without any thought of benefiting future lives or attaining liberation or enlightenment, just seeking the happiness and comfort of this life and recognize that as negative motivation rooted in attachment, ignorance and attachment. And by following ignorance and attachment we create negative karma, we leave imprints on our consciousness that will ripen sooner or later into experiences suffering and dissatisfaction. So, make a determination not to follow that motivation and replace it with a positive one and think briefly something like this. Since beginning was time, I've been circling in cyclic existence and my mind has been my beginningless mind has been wandering from one samsaric realm to the other mostly in the three lower realms the animal realm, hungry ghost realm, the hell realm most of the time since beginning was time my mind has been down there you know, experiencing suffering beyond imagination. This time though, I've been reborn. In this life I've been reborn in the upper realm and not in the upper realms of the gods but in the human realm and I've received not just an ordinary human rebirth but a perfect human rebirth with eight freedoms and ten richnesses that perfect human rebirth that gives me the opportunity to hear, study, understand, practice the Dharma. The main definition of practicing Dharma is avoiding actions that create negative karma. You know, actions done mainly for the benefit of this life alone. Avoiding negative actions and practicing, developing, and doing positive actions you know, creating the causes for happiness in future lives. So three levels of positive or positive action are uh, creating the cause to receive uh, to avoid rebirth in the lower realms in future lives to receive upper rebirth like this one
that, that that such rebirth is still in cyclic existence. So um, there's no security there. Because as long as we're in cyclic existence, we can always again be reborn in the lower realms which are difficult to escape. So much better to strive for total, complete liberation from cyclic existence. You know, to get oneself off the wheel of life, beyond karma, into uh, into nirvana you know, everlasting blissful peace of mind but that's not enough either because you know we don't fulfill our own potential and it doesn't help other sentient beings fulfill theirs. So the way to fulfill our own potential is to strive for and attain enlightenment. once enlightened then we can help all sentient beings also fulfill their ultimate potential and lead them to enlightenment so our goal sh- you know, the motivation for all our actions should be to reach enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings Developing that kind of attitude, that kind of mind, uh, that that kind of mind that strives for enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings, called bodhicitta. So that's what we should understand and practice. And there are two ways, two paths to enlightenment. One is the gradual, slow, much slower path of the, the Sutrayana path, or the path of the perfections, or the and the fast and the, the, the quick path to enlightenment, Vajrayana, practice of tantra. So whichever path we follow. We need a teacher. We need uh, we need to find the right teacher and to follow that right teacher's advice. Perfectly. So, in order to do that, we need to study the teachings on finding and developing, maintaining proper relationship with a spiritual teacher and think you know I'm I'm here at the center this morning to study the teachings on guru devotion in order to reach enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings that's that's our motivation for being here today Okay. So try not just to think the words, but to feel the meaning of the words in your heart. How many countless, innumerable, unimaginable sentient beings there are throughout infinite space experiencing great suffering. How wonderful it is to be in a position to try
try to do something to help them. And try to feel personal responsibility for enlightening each and every one of those sentient beings from whom we've received so much benefit, because of whom we have this perfect human rebirth with all its advantages. So the topic today is 50 verses of Guru Devotion, which is um, uh, a text written by Ashva Gosha. So he wrote this text, uh, he's an Indian scholar um, who lived in like the first century. Um, so I've got a couple of commentaries here which there were links to in the email. Did you see that? A couple of commentaries by Geshe Ngan Dagi who was the main teacher at the Tibetan Library in Dharamsala when it, uh, from when it was founded in about 1971 until he left for New Zealand of all places uh, in about 85. So he was a really great teacher and um, uh, teacher of many of the Western translators um, and Stephen Batchelor and Alan Wallace and um, Alex Berzin, John Landau, um, Ben Mullen, Brian Beresford. There were um, so back in those days there were two um, groups of Westerners studying Tibetan Buddhism. I mean there are more, but. Um, in, in, in this tradition, in the Gelug tradition, Lama Tsongkhapa's tradition, there were, there were two main groups. There was a group in Dharamsala studying around the Tibetan Library and there was um, the other group, students of Lama Yeshe, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, studying at Kopan in Nepal. So they thought they were superior because they, they were all studying Tibetan and we thought we were superior because we were mostly monks and nuns. You know. In fact, we're both superior <laughs> to everybody else. So. But we, we, all, we at Copan thought they were a little dissolute, you know, because you know, they went to a couple of classes a day and then they went to their private lessons learning Tibetan and so but the rest of the time they were hanging hanging out and, um, uh, what can I say, leading a lay person's lifestyle where we were very holy and uh, keeping the, trying to keep the uh, 
precepts of the monastic ordination. But occasionally some of them would want to wander into our realm and some of us would wander into their realm. Mainly when we got kicked out of Nepal when we couldn't extend our visas. You know. And anyway, a lot of great stuff came out of those guys in Dharamsala. Um, and the Tibetan Library published books. So they published a little book of 50 verses of Guru Devotion, just the text. And then um, there was this short commentary by Geshe Dagi and a longer commentary by Geshe Ngondagi. So these are both on uh, online. They used to be on the archive website. They used to be at lamayeshi.com, but then we set up another website called teachingsfromtibet.com so I think most of the teachings that aren't Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa we moved to this other one just to keep the Lama Yeshi wisdom archive more it's supposed to be the archive of the FPMT so that's the focus mainly on those teachings but you know so I think we've moved these teachings across to there so I guess I said that uh, about Ashley Gosha um, so he said, um, uh, this text of 50 verse of Guru Devotion uh, was written about 1st century BC by BC. Uh, yeah, about 400 years after the Buddha by Ashva Gosha, the Indian, this Indian poet was known by name, many names such as Aryashura, Matrichita, Patrichita, Maitri, Matichitra and Bhavideva, I don't know why. He was contemporary of King Kanishka of the Kusan dynasty and having previously been a strong non-Buddhist believer he became an extremely devout follower of the Buddhist path and wrote many works on its various aspects. So, um, you know, we know Buddhism is divided into these two main schools, the Hinayana and the Mahayana. Everybody knows that, correct? And um, so the Hinayana, or uh, lesser vehicle, which is a term disliked by the politically correct um, and by the practitioners of that vehicle, because nobody wants to be lesser. But um, I can't remember all the reasons. Geshe Dage actually explained clearly in one of his books. So there are six reasons why one is called the lesser vehicle, the Hinayana, and the other one's called the great vehicle. Uh, I can't remember all those reasons now. But, um, you know, one is that the goal is great, uh, that the goal of the lesser vehicle, the Hinayana, is uh, individual liberation or nirvana, and the goal of the Mahayana is the full enlightenment of Buddhahood. So that's, that's a greater achievement, higher level of mind, much higher. Um, not that there's anything wrong with nirvana, but uh, it's just not the end of the line, you know. So we have to set our goal to reach the end of the line, the end of the road, the end of the path. Uh, it's, it's, Mahayana is also greater because it's, uh, it's practiced for the sake of all sentient beings whereas the main goal of practice of the Hinayana is you know, self-liberation just fr freeing one sentient being oneself from, from suffering um, Mahayana is greater because there are many greater and vaster number of scriptures to be studied and understood and practiced um, yeah, I can't remember exactly the other reasons but uh, you can look them up with your homework am I here next week? yes yeah. ok so I'll check next if anyone's found the six reasons why Mahayana is great is called great and the Hinayana is called lesser. 
So sometimes it's Hinayana is called the Theravada, the doctrine of the elders. Lama Yeshi explained that um, after the Buddha passed away, the his followers, the uh, Hinayana followers, split into eighteen schools, uh, of which the Theravada was one, and the Theravada is the only one that has come, still exists to this day. So you, that's, you know the Buddhism practiced in Sri Lanka or Thailand or Burma or uh, Laos, Cambodia, like that. Um, so that's called Theravada, doctrine of the elders. And the Mahayana was the Buddhism practice in you know uh, northern India, Nepal, Tibet, Japan, Korea, China, like that. So sometimes they're called northern Buddha- Buddhism and southern Buddhism also. It's even more politically correct. Um, and then the Mahayana. As I mentioned, just mentioned, you know, has these two divisions: paramitayana, the path of the perfections, the slow, gradual path to enlightenment, and the vajrayana, the quick path to enlightenment. So quick is good. Quick is recommended, but quick is hard. You know. So, in ter- so whichever path we're following, we need a teacher. So, in the Hinayana, um, actually, the main guide for Hinayana practitioners is the Code of Ethics. Uh, um, not so much the physical teacher. Physical teacher teaches helps teach you meditation and teaches, you know, gives you commentaries on the sutras and, and explains Buddha's teachings and stuff like that. But if your teacher tells you to do something which you feel contradicts your, um, you know, vowed rules of conduct, the precepts you've taken, then the those rules that you're following take precedence over what the teacher tells you to do. So you don't have to what the teacher says if you feel it uh, contradicts your vows. So the vows can be the five lay precepts or the uh, different numbers of precepts that novice or full monks and nuns take in that tradition. So in a, in a sense the actual teacher is the is the vows you've taken. That, that's what you have to follow very strictly. And, um, you know, sometimes... And you know, sometimes some people feel it's, they're too... Infle- that, that sort of mode of behaviour is a little inflexible, especially these days. Like the monks aren't allowed to touch money or touch a female at all, you know, shake hands, not like that, not just allowed to spend a, roo- a night under the under the roof uh, with, with a female, even if it's your mother, you know. So maybe it was possible in the time of the Buddha, but these days it's a little impractical. So I don't know how strictly they follow those rules now. In the Mahayana, um, you know, these, these two schools in the Paramitayana, uh, you know, Lama Sopa has explained, Lama Sopa Rinpoche has explained that if your teacher tells you to do something which you feel isn't right according to your understanding of the Dharma, it contradicts the Dharma in some way, you can uh, politely refuse or ask for clarification. But if the teacher tells you two, three, four times to do it uh, over your respectful, polite objections, then you should do it, even if you feel it's wrong, if, if you've questioned it and like that. In the Vajrayana, um, 
if the teacher tells you to do something, you do it without question. So you, you know, the implication is obvious. You have to really make sure that you've uh, chosen a valid teacher. If you make a mistake, if you if you choose someone who's uh, uh, not a fully qualified teacher, not a, not a valid teacher, and a Vajra, in the Vajrayana, you know, and uh, and the the deal is that you have to do whatever the teacher says, and and, and you've picked the wrong wrong an unqualified person, then you can see how you can easily get into trouble. And we kind of see that happening a lot these days, right? Especially in the realm of uh, sexual misconduct or sexual abuse, really. Um, you know, there have been some fairly high profile scandals and probably a lot of low profile ones we don't hear that much about. And the, the, the reason that um, um, in the Vajrayana that we should do whatever the teacher tells us is because in our view we have to see the teacher as fully enlightened Buddha which you don't necessarily have to do in, in the other lower in the lower paths, especially in the Theravada. I think in the Mahayana um, uh, actually I'm not sure that what that um, whether you have to see the Guru as a Buddha in the Sutrayana. So that should be checked. You know the the um, the book on guru devotion in Tibetan Buddhism is, is Lama Zopa Rinpoche's book called The Heart of the Path. Mm-hmm. So that you everybody knows that book. Big one. So it might be in there. So you can look it up there. But this text, the, this fulfilment of all hopes, is uh, Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary on the 50 verses of guru devotion. So this is um, out of out of stock in wisdom publications at the moment. We've been talking about reprinting and it's been out for two or three years, I think. I don't, I'm not sure why. Um, this text, 50 verses of Guru devotion, is written for practitioners of Vajrayana, where you see the Buddha, Guru as a Buddha and uh, follow the Guru's advice and questioningly. So last time, when, when was we talked about this a little bit last time, when was that? A few weeks ago? A couple of months ago? It was um, in the winter, like January, it was the last... Really? Yeah. I don't know, well, I don't know if anyone was there or not. I was there. Um, you recommended that book? Yeah. Heart of the Oh, Heart of the Park, yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course I did. Um, anyway, there's uh, I, I, the Mahayana guru in general has ten qualities that we're supposed to look for before we take that person as guru and the Vajrayana guru has those ten plus another twenty so I went through them last time um, then they're enumerated at least in this short commentary by Geshe Daga. I, I won't necessarily read them all again now because we did that before. Yeah, they're also, of course, in this long. They're in the long commentary as well. Um,
So Geshe-Dagi says, um, success in following either the Sutra or Tantra path to enlightenment depends solely upon your Guru devotion, as Lord Buddha indicated in the Lotus Sutra and in, um, uh, in one of the commentaries to the Hivajra Tantra, where he stated that in future times of degeneration, like this, he would take the form of gurus. Buddha would appear as a guru and therefore at such times gurus should be as, as respected as Buddhas because they are the Buddha's living representatives. The guru devotion involves both thought and action. The most important thing is to develop total conviction that your guru is a Buddha. That, uh, that is a prerequisite for receiving any insight. Whether you're aiming to attain liberation in order to benefit mainly yourself or reach the perfected state of fully enlightened Buddha, in order to enlighten all others, your guru can show you the way only if he himself, sorry about the pronouns, um, has already gained these achievements. If you doubt your guru's competence and ability to guide you, your practices will be extremely unstable and you'll be unable to make any concrete progress. You must have full confidence that it's possible to become enlightened, that your guru is living proof of this, and that by following the Buddha's teachings as your guru instructs, you can achieve the same. Only then will it be possible for you to gain any real benefit from your practices. So, you know, in my experience, it's very hard to uh, see this human being as a fully enlightened Buddha. You know, if you read about the qualities of, of a Buddha, which are explained in great detail in the teachings on refuge, for example, you know, it's, um, it's hard because we you know, um, we always believe what our senses tell us. You know, the, the way we see the world through our five senses and the, the way our mind works, our sixth sense, uh, we really believe that what our mind tells us and what our senses tell us is true, that things exist in that way. So it's very hard to, first of all, just see that everything is that we see is just a projection of our own mind. Things don't really exist the way they appear. You know. Just that's kind of hard to... I, I find that hard to get my mind around, I don't know about you. So when we see, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, or, uh, you know, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, or Geshe La, you know, whenever we see our teachers, uh, they appear as human beings. It's very hard to remember that this is actually an enlightened being appearing in human form, just being able to be a commun communicate with us on our level. And that, um, you know, there's a lot more behind the physical appearance, a lot more that we don't see. You know, one time Lama Yeshi, Lama Zopa Rinpoche took me with them when they went to visit their root guru, His Holiness Trijang Rinpoche, who was one of His Holiness's holiest die on the tutors. So I just sat in the back, they talked in Tibetan, you know. And um, then when we came out, Lama Yeshi turned to me and said, Did you saw Haruka? <laughs> Haruka's Lama Yeshi's Chakrasambhara was Lama Yeshi's main meditational deity and uh, Trijang Rinpoche was the embodiment or manifestation of Haruka, Chakrasambhara. So they were in there talking to their root guru, seeing him as, as a deity not just thinking as a deity, but actually seeing him as a deity. And so when Lama Yeshi asked me that, I said, well, not really, I just saw this old monk, you know. Mm -hmm. 
uh, one of the many times I disappointed Lama Yeshe, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know, traps for young players. <coughs> and I, you know, that was uh, 40 years ago or something, I don't know. So still no progress in seeing the Guru as a Buddha or in following instructions properly actually either. So, you know, it takes work. So Gesheng Nandagila said, um, seeing only good qualities in your Guru therefore is the way to develop these qualities yourself. Seeing only good qualities in your Guru is the way to develop these qualities yourself. Normally most people are blind to their own shortcomings while the faults of others shine out clearly. But if you did not possess these same faults yourself, you'd be unable to recognize them in others. If there are two pieces of fruit, one ripe and one rotten, and the person next to you takes the ripe one, it's only because of your own greed that you accuse the person of being greedy and selfish. If you were unattached to the fruit, it would not matter to you which one they took. You would simply see them as having taken a piece of fruit. Likewise, if you can train yourself to see only good qualities and never any faults in your guru, this positive outlook will come to pervade, amplify and reflect your own state of mind. I took my mother, she came visited me in India one time in uh, 1977. I was, in, I was, just, I was living in Delhi. I, 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 uh, I just moved to Delhi to try and start a centre. I mean, yes, she sent me there. So my mother came and I took her to Dharamsala to meet His Holiness and the two tutors. And uh, it was a lot easier those days. She, she had a private interview, 45 minute private interview with His Holiness. And um, many they interacted. I just sat quietly there, you know. And uh, afterwards, you know, we came. She was impressed by his holiness, but but she said, you know, if he's so perfect, why does he wear glasses? <laughs> <laughs> and we thought, well, you know, maybe so he could, people with glasses can relate to him. I don't know. <laughs> Well, maybe he just needs them, you know. <laughs> um, so likewise, if you can train yourself to see only good qualities and never any faults in your guru, this positive outlook will come to pervade, amplify and reflect your own state of mind. As we all have Buddha nature within us, the clear, uncontaminated state of pure mind established without any true independent existence, seeing our Guru as a Buddha gives us the possibility of activating and realizing our own Buddha nature. Seeing only our Guru's faults merely reinforces our own shortcomings and negative attitudes. Seeing only the Guru's perfection a enables us to attain the perfection of Buddhahood ourselves. Therefore, one of the main practices of Guru Yoga, uh, particularly in Tantra, is to realize the inseparability of our own mind with our Guru, our Buddhas and our meditational deity, which is a pure manifestation of the enlightened mind. Thus, Guru devotion is the root of all attainments. Guru devotion is the root of all attainments. So in the um, main commentaries on the Lam Rim, on the stages of the path, so everyone knows Lam Rim. Um, so you know one of the 
there's some you know prelim, preamble in 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 the in the commentaries like Liberation of the Palm of Your Hand or Lum Rim Chenmo, you know the great treatise about you know the qualities of um, uh, You know the qualities of Atisha, who propounded the first Lumrim teaching, who who first arranged the Buddha's teachings into that sort of stages of the past format, and the qualities of the Dharma, and uh, so on. And then and then there's the teaching on um, on the Guru devotion. So and that's called the root of the path. But often, you know, gurus, you know, those teachers who are qualified, they, they often, especially, well, teaching Westerners anyway, they usually don't start with that teaching because, you know, our minds are so negative and so uh, um, kind of warped that it's very easy to think, oh, this person is just aggrandizing himself and, you know, trying to, you know, get us to join his cult and give him all our money. Uh, so, you know, we're, you know we're, and it's good to be sceptical too. And, and I'm sure there are teachers out there who have that kind of motivation, you know. But when... Um, When we first got to Nepal, to Copan, to you know our heart centre of this organisation, um, back in the 70s, uh, Lama Zopa Rinpoche was teaching uh, two one-month courses a year in 72, in 73, 74. Um, there are two one-month courses, and um, then the Lama started travelling to the west, and there wasn't time to do two, so then they just did. One November and in November and that course. Has anyone been to Copan? The November course? Are you kidding me? Okay, well, it doesn't count. <laughs> that's uh, I mean, you know, that's really uh, the pinnacle experience, the peak experience of the FPMT is Copan one month course. I think they're about been about fifty at this point, I think the last one was maybe the 50th or the 51st. So this, you know, bucket list, bucket list stuff. So, um, so while you're all young and healthy, uh, try to put that on your to-do list. Copan, one month course. Do you live, like, do you, do you live there and everything and do exactly what you Yeah. Yeah, it's residential. I mean, you uh, you get there, uh, and you know it starts at um, five thirty or something the first day, and goes till nine or ten o'clock that night. And uh, every day is Groundhog Day. You know? <laughs> for, for thirty days, it's the same thing. Get up, you know, same routine hour and a half meditation. You never meditated before, you sit there for an hour and a half the first day, you know. So what the hell am I doing, you know? I should still be in bed, you know. And, uh, you know, they give you, I mean, I'm, it's probably kind of five star now compared to how it was in the, the good old days. Um, but they used to serve this breakfast with soy coffee in chipped enamel mugs you never drunk out of a chipped enamel mug, you always wonder what kind of bacteria are mm. sort of yeah. in the cracks and crevices because they're only washed with lukewarm water. Um, anyway, we survived. So, um, suji. Anyone eaten suji? It's kind of this weird cereal made out of I don't know what it's made out of, cracked wheat or something. It's like 
this thin, gruelly kind of stuff, you know, with soy coffee. It's the first training in renunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, it's an experience none of us would ever have swapped for anything, ever. So, we had this textbook that was created by... Uh, my first course was the third course in, in November 72, and the students from the second course, which had been held in March that year, had put together Rinpoche's notes from his teachings and, and put together sort of a textbook called uh, The Wish-Fulfilling Golden Sun. And uh, that started... The first teaching in that book was called The Mind is Beginningless. And you'd never write a textbook for Tibetans or Eastern people in general mind is beginningless, you know, there are past and future lives, you know, reincarnation, because they all know that. <laughs> it's pretty much a given, you know. Why are, we, why are you telling us this? We know. We don't know that, Westerners. So, so Tibetans who are, I mean, you know, Eastern people in general, I guess, I don't know, um, if you start at the Lam Rim teaching, teaching with Guru devotion, which is kind of the logical place to start, it's the root of the path, you know? The root is where everything comes from. So you teach that first, how to develop a healthy root. So, but for Westerners, it's, it's you know, there are virtually no teachings on Guru devotion in that whole book. There still aren't, actually. I mean, not that Rimshi, he only used it for the first few years. Then he started teaching from other texts, uh, uh, another Lumrim text called Essential Nectar, and then um, Shanti Deva, then it sort of became a little more free form. It was interesting, after the seventh course, uh, and in all those courses we used this book, and, and the use the book means Rimshi would, you know, read, you know, a couple of sentences, and then he was give a little commentary on those sentences, you know, for a couple of minutes or for three days, I mean, depending. I, I think depending on who was there and what they needed, you know. Um, from his side, he could have taught for two or three days on every sentence, but... Um, And he would teach in this, um, what can I say, um, he had this sort of otherworldly presence when he was on the throne teaching. And he, he would often te teach almost the whole class, the whole thing for a couple of hours, you know, with his eyes closed. And uh, um, he later said that he felt that in those early courses, up to, I think, the seventh, um, that he, w he was channeling Lama Yeshe. He wasn't really teaching from his own wisdom. Or, you know, he was, Lama Yeshe was teaching through him. And often he'd be just going, mm-hmm, oh yeah. It was like he was communicating with somebody else. And it was... It was I don't think we have any video of that. We didn't have video cameras or cell phones. Um, but there were no teachings on guru devotion, basically, for all these beginning, beginning, beginner Westerners. And um, so scepticism is good. I mean, the Buddha himself encouraged scepticism. You know, he said, he said, don't believe, don't believe, what I'm teaching you is true, but don't believe it just because I said so. You know, you have to check it out for yourself and uh, examine it in different ways and come to your own conclusion, whether you accept these teachings or not. You know, you have to be convinced in your own mind that they're true and not just think, oh, you know, 
I guess the Buddha had some pretty overpowering charisma, putting it mildly, and um, so it would be easy as the Buddha said, you know. Um, so that's kind of healthy scepticism is good, but uh, you know, attributing your own selfish motivation to somebody else is not so good. But that's what we might tend to do. That the teacher is teaching about guru devotion just to kind of get us into his inner circle and then take advantage of us. Because that's what we do. Well, that's what I'd do. Anyway, since I'm... <laughs> It's very safe for me to talk about guru devotion since I'm. <laughs> there's not a smell of guru about me, so. Uh, barely a smell of students, so. So I can talk about it. Um, so the guru devotion is the root of all attainments. Um, so if your guru acts in a seemingly unenlightened manner and you feel it would be hypocritical to think of think uh, of, of, of uh, them can I use them as a singular? You, you, but you can do that. I can say him. Does anyone have any female gurus? Yeah. Alright. Kandrala, Ravina. So I'll say them. It says him, mostly. Oh, this is in... The, anyway, whatever. Um, you should remember that your own opinions are unreliable and the apparent faults you see may be simply a reflection of your own deluded state of mind. Also, I mean, we know very well from the teachings on emptiness that we do not see reality. And also, you know, the law of karma lies beneath all our experiences. What we think, what we say, what we do, you know, what we feel, all these things. And we don't see karma at all. We can't see it. But it's there. It's kind of, at the conventional level, karma is running the whole show. And, and we, don't, we don't see that. So there are a lot of hidden things that we can't see. Actually, karma is kind of harder to understand than emptiness in, in, in some ways. You know? Like His Holiness Dalai Lama said that um, uh, when teaching Dharma, I don't know if he meant to Westerners or not, but uh, when teaching... It, he says it's often, you know, people who, for beginners, it's easier to start by teaching uh, on emptiness. And people think, oh, emptiness is like this really esoteric, deep, profound subject, which it is. But, you know, you think, oh, that should come later. It's kind of university level. We're in kindergarten here. But it, the teaching, e emptiness is something that can be understood uh, logically um, and can be explained, it can be proven logically whereas karma can't be proven logically in the same way, you know? So, um, in order for people to develop faith in the Buddha's teachings, if you explain emptiness and you give logical reasons for why things don't exist the way they appear, etc., etc., you know, and impermanence and all this stuff, um, people think, oh, okay, I understand. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing teaching. That's a, that's a, that's a wonderful teaching. So then you can start having faith in the Buddha that this this person who taught emptiness uh, kind of knew what he was talking about when he's talking about reality. So then the Buddha's other teachings, it's easier to accept the other the Buddha's other teachings even if if they can't be proven logically correct, you know. 
that they somehow have to be understood through experience and through putting them into practice. So, you, you know, there are these... Um, uh, three levels of phenomena uh, or, um, you know, three ways of knowing something's true. There's, there's a level where you, you experience things through your senses. Hot is hot, cold is cold, sweet is sweet, sour is sour. I mean, you know, you, you, you experience things directly and, and you understand them. Of course, ultimately, they may not exist in that way, but at the conventional level, at the level of cause and effect and uh, uh, sensory perception and so on, you know, there, there, there's, well, you know, Buddhism talks about the two truths. The things are true at a conventional level and things are true at an ultimate level. So at the conventional level, um, it's convention, conventionally we've agreed that, you know, red is red and blue is blue and, uh, of course, I don't know where colourblind people fit in, but um, you know, hot is hot and cold is cold. Uh, there's conventional truth. So, um, uh, so we we can understand you know overt phenomena in that way. Then there, there are things that we can't experience through our senses, but we know they're true through logical deduction. Um, you know, you you may never have experienced Australia personally, so you, if you've never been there, you don't really know that it exists through your own experience. But you know, you meet Australians who tell you what a wonderful place it is, and about koalas and kangaroos and and sort of you can understand logically oh it must exist because there are people who come from there and explained about it anyway there's so many different things you can understand through logic like emptiness so those are partially hidden phenomena so there are overt phenomena we experience our sense and then there's partially hidden phenomena that you can only get to through logical deduction and then there are you know totally hidden phenomena that you can really only understand um, through, uh, I mean, the, when we're talking about Dharma and phenomena is called like scriptural, the term is scriptural authority. But, you know, you're through, through the experience of others. So in the case, the experience of the Buddha, he, he understands karma perfectly and explains it perfectly. And until we become a Buddha, you know, even our hearts and the high level and uh, Arya Bodhisattvas don't understand all the ultimate fine minutiae of karma. Only a fully enlightened Buddha can understand karma. So we have to rely on, on that sort of uh, authority uh, um, to tell us about these things because we can't experience them ourselves and we can't experience them through logical deduction. So we have to rely on somebody who knows. So again, you have to have faith in some, that, that person. So if you can develop faith in the Buddha by understanding, well, the person who explained about emptiness in this very clear way, this profound subject kind of knows what's going on. So it's things that I can't understand through personal experience or through logic. If the Buddha explained it, then I can pretty much uh, take that on faith. Right. Well, in this, as I said, in, in, in terms of Dharma topics, you know. They are the authorities. Yeah, they're the authorities. I mean, you can... Uh, there are other authorities. You don't know... Uh, if, if you've never taken... Um, you've got an infection, like a strep throat or something, and you've never taken penicillin, you don't know that it works, and you can't logically deduce penicillin is going to work because you're not going to swab your throat and 
look at it under the microscope and see, well, this is the eosinophilic bacteria, or, you know, blah, blah. you rely on the authority of the doctor. So, I mean, that's one level of the same thing, right? But in terms of karma, uh, you know, your GP is probably not going to be able to explain that very well. So, um, so you rely on the Buddha. You have a problem with that? Have a problem with it? Yeah. What? What you? No. Where are you no, coming from? No, I'm. I'm just. Um, I'm just thinking about different things because I. Um, you know, I'm trying to focus on this. And. Um, What's a social scientist? What? What's a social scientist? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Sorry. But you're a trained one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One of these social scientists, um, a German by the name of Max Weber, talked about different forms of authority and where their legitimacy comes from. And so that's why I was asking about the source of the authority um, from scriptural authority. Because a lot of, in, in according to um, Weber, um, the authority, legitimate authority comes from belief belief on the part of those who are doing the believing that the authority is legitimate. Well, so the Buddha is established as a reliable authority, as I mentioned, really in the teachings on refuge, that explains Buddha's qualities and how the Buddha attained the qualities and what, you know, what those qualities are. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, And in in terms of, uh, you know, seeing him as a valid person, then, uh, you know, but like, as I said, studying his teachings on emptiness can give you a certain level of respect or or faith that that what he teaches is correct um, so that you, you can accept the things that aren't so obvious as probably correct and then maybe continue to investigate and experience. You know, in terms of, of karma, for example, uh, the way we uh, put karma into practice is by taking precepts, by taking either, you know, five lay vows or we do the eight Mahayana precepts. And you experience living in the precepts. Uh, you know, the eight precepts we take for 24 hours, uh, not a big ask, you know, and you can experience experience that for see if it's, if you get benefit from following those eight eight disciplines um, uh, and so then maybe you do that a few times and then you think okay well maybe I'll take one of the five precepts you know not to kill which is kind of the main one you know so then you abstain from killing and uh, you go to see how effect it has on your life you know because it may not have an effect on your life it still depends on your karma, but uh, generally, living in the precepts for, for a while, it's um, you know some people think, oh, this taking precepts, not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to do this, not to do that. It's all on the, oh, not doing, and this is like. You know, I'm denying my spontaneity or my. Uh, uh, is there another word? Spontaneity or creativity or being in the moment, you know. It's kind of restricting, you know. Uh, and in one way, it is restricting because our minds are out of control. We're not in control of our minds, our minds are in control of us. So. You know, there, there are the are, are reins on a horse have a purpose. You know, so the precepts are. Lama Yeshe called taking precepts. You take them voluntarily, understanding that this is a beneficial thing to do and this is good for me. Uh, is putting yourself into a 
kind of a peaceful prison. He, he, and he'd go like this. <laughs> putting himself into a peaceful prison. Because this is not a prison that you want to get out of. This is a prison that you really want to be in. Because we recognise that the mind is out of control and does stupid things. It's like a baby, you know, or like a toddler. You have to watch a toddler all the time and, and you've got to control the toddler. I've never had any toddlers, but I know people who have. And um, and I've seen toddlers and I really don't want any. But... Um, <laughs> um, especially now, and uh, your mind is like an uncontrolled toddler, you know, it just wants to do what it wants and it cries when it doesn't get what it wants and so it needs some kind of guidance, you know. So the precepts are a way to start guiding our mind, you know, and then you start to experience the benefits. And actually, taking precepts, you make a decision for the rest of your life. I'm not going to kill any living being, you know. Okay, inadvertently it may happen. Or indirectly, it may happen, you know, without choice. But like, then you're free. You never have to think again for the rest of your life. Will I do this or not? No, I'm not. I've decided not to, or to steal, or lie, or sexual misconduct, or getting intoxicated, or, or then all the 36 or the hundreds of precepts that monks and nuns take. You know, it's kind of liberating. Now, in in order to um, keep the precepts you've taken, we need to uh, create the right environment too. So, you know, if you're trying to stop smoking, you're not going to want to live in a house full of smokers. Uh, or if you're trying to stop drinking or doing meth or whatever you guys do. Uh, <laughs> Um, you don't want to live in a, in a crack house, you know. You want a better environment, you know. So if you want to um, keep your vows of celibacy, you know, you, you know, now, <laughs> in the old days, if you, you know, if you're a monk and you wanted to stop sexual activity, you live in a monastery. And if you're a nun, you wanted to get away from the temptation of sexual activity, you live in a nunnery. Now, if you're gay, I don't know how it works anymore, you know, or if you're trans or whatever the other variations are, I'm a little bit behind. But, um, uh, but the principle is, you know, uh, take yourself out of a situation um, that you don't want to be in for a while until your mind is strong. And then you can go out and then when you're confronted with the temptation, it's not temptation anymore. You, you're over it. You know? So, the, and the, pre, the precepts are kind of, they're sort of, uh, te in a way, they're a temporary thing. You take them for life because we don't, even if we keep them impeccably, probably, you know, in, in terms of infinite time, one life, you know, eighty, hundred years even, isn't very, isn't much time at all. It's pretty short, especially at the end when you look back. Um, so you know, some people say, "Oh, I don't want to. I'd, I'd like to take precepts, but I'd, I'd, I'm not going to because I don't think I can keep them." So it's like, well, if you're going to wait to a stage where you're not going to break precepts to take them, then you don't need them anymore. Because the purpose of them is to, to get to that point where there's not even a chance in hell that you're going to break them, you know? It's like, like I said last time or before, you know, you only have to put your hand on a stove, hot stove once. You don't have to make a vow not to do it again, you know. You know. So when r results of killing, stealing, lying, all these things that we take precepts not to do, when the, when the results, the suffering results of doing those actions are as clear to us as uh, putting your hand on a hot stove, burning hurts, you know, is then at that stage we may not need the precepts anymore. 
the, to get us to that point. Um, okay. So your own opinion is unreliable and the apparent faults you see may be simply a reflection of your own deluded state of mind. Also, you should think that if your guru acted in a completely perfect manner, he would be inaccessible and you'd be unable to relate to him. It is therefore out of your guru's great compassion that they may show you apparent flaws. This is part of guru's skillful means in order for guru to be able to teach you. Uh, they're, mirror, they're mirroring your own faults. Therefore, check within and learn from the guru how to remove your shortcomings. If you're only intent on criticizing your guru, uh, he'll never be able to benefit you. So it was Buddha Vajradhara himself who said that your guru is to be take, seen as a Buddha. Buddha Vajradhara, in Tibetan Dorji Chung. Someone asked Lama Yeshi once, who's Dorji Chung? He said, oh, he's the biggest Buddha. They're all big, actually. Uh, it's the primordial Buddha. But Buddha Vajradhar himself said that your guru should be seen as a Buddha. Therefore, if you have faith and take refuge in the Buddha's teachings, uh, you will try to understand what Vajradhara meant by this. Buddhas exert a great positive influence on the world in the same way that the sun does. But just as a magnifying glass is needed to focus the rays of the sun in order for tinder to catch fire, so too is a guru required to focus the Buddha's virtuous conduct into your mind stream to inspire you to follow the path. Just as a magnifying glass is needed to focus the rays of the sun in order for tinder to catch fire, so too is a guru required to focus the Buddha's virtuous conduct into your mind stream to inspire you to follow the path. Thus, as living examples representing the Buddhas, gurus carry on the work of all the enlightened beings, acting as an accessible focal point for your practices so that you can gain Buddhahood yourself. So I'm, I have to go somewhere, so I'm going to shortchange you today. Uh, anyway, I'll continue with this next week if you're interested. In the meantime, you, you've got the links. You can read these uh, com teachings, commentaries online. Uh, I guess you can't. Maybe the, the book's available as an e-book. I don't know. I've got it as a second. You can buy it on Amazon. You can go buy it as a second-hand book. Oh, second-hand, yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. sure there's lots of people who don't want their copy. Well, fortunately for us, but yeah. unfortunately for them. Oh, second hand, that's a good yeah. idea. I kill yeah, it's true. Well, I'll sell you this one for 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway... Um, Yeah, so we'll just, uh, you know, as we say, that positive actions have three parts, the correct motivation, I think we did that, correct action, I think talking about this teaching is correct action, so the third part is correct dedication, so to kind of seal the merit we've created, hand over to our Master of Ceremonies. Yeah. Page 39.
Seven.